During the Vietnam War, the Special Forces soldiers who volunteered for MACVISOG, ran top-secret combat operations in Laos and Cambodia, aimed at interdicting the North Vietnamese supply lines. These missions were so dangerous, that during a 12-month period spanning 1968 and 1969, every SOG ground operator was wounded at least once, and nearly half were killed. Losses that occurred as their helicopters were shot down, or by being inserted into areas swarming with enemy troops, were out of their control. All the men of SOG could hope for, was to be inserted cleanly, and have time to get organized on the ground. In order to survive what was sure to become a deadly game of hide-and-seek with the enemy, a SOG operator needed six skills. We're not talking about physical strength, incredible courage, or marksmanship. Those were prerequisites. These skills were much more subtle and seldom discussed, but no less important. As we go along if you have experience and can think of additional skills, let us know in the comments. Be sure to stick around for the very controversial number one skill, it took to survive in MACVSOG. Let's get into it. Number 6. Bonding with foreign fighters. MACVSOG personnel underwent intensive training in a wide range of unconventional warfare skills. Key in this training was learning to work with indigenous fighters. SOG primarily employed Montagnard tribesmen, as infantrymen to supplement their ranks. In their remote jungle mountain villages, the Montagnards avoided the civilized population. Going barefoot in the jungle, wearing loincloths, they were hunter-gatherers who practiced slash and burn agriculture. The Montagnards had poor relations with all of the Vietnamese. Many were pressed into service by the North Vietnamese, to construct the infiltration routes in Laos. They were shunned by the South Vietnamese, who openly called them Moi, or savages. Caught in the war's crossfire, the Montagnards had been recruited in the early 1960s by the Special Forces, and trained to provide security for their villages and patrol the jungle mountains along the Laotian border. Many had been fighting for years, with a succession of Special Forces leaders, before they made their way to the more demanding, and much higher paying jobs in SOG. Jobs that made them wealthy and respected members of their tribe. Like their Green Beret predecessors, SOG operators found the always smiling Montagnards easy to get along with. They learned their culture and formed close friendships with them. A few Montagnards had learned enough English to function as interpreters. Others, with the most experience ran the point. Walking through the jungle in the lead, responsible for alerting the team to danger. The rest became riflemen who silently carried heavy loads through the steep mountain jungle, and supplied firepower during contact with the enemy. The Montagnards had no concept of victory in the war. They knew that the Americans would come and go, and eventually leave for good. Then they would lose their high-paying jobs, move back into the mountains, and their fate would be in the hands of the Vietnamese, be it north or south. While the Americans sought to accomplish missions, the Montagnards sought to survive those missions. A crucial difference SOG operators had to understand. Montagnard soldiers would quickly lose faith in an operator who put them in unnecessarily dangerous situations. In case of a life-threatening encounter with the enemy, they looked to the American with the radio to decisively summon helicopters and gunships to rescue them. The ability to develop strong bonds with their tribal fighters, by being tactically competent, established the trust that was essential for the SOG operator's survival. As Mike Hoare, the commander of Commando 5 in the Congo remarked, When you employ mercenaries, it's best if you're winning. Number 5. Advanced Map Reading the ability to use the terrain to the team's tactical advantage was a critical skill. Maneuver in open areas is uncomplicated, however, dense mountain jungle often limited the operator's view of the landscape. It was quite easy to walk into a potential area of contact before it could be seen. The enemy was fully aware that inflicting a disabling wound on any member of the small unit, would greatly reduce the team's mobility, putting it at risk of annihilation. Most infantrymen think of maps as navigational tools. The SOG operator took this to a higher level developing the almost unconscious skill to look at the elevation lines on a map and mentally projecting a 3D image, to visualize what the terrain was going to look like as the team moved forward. This enabled the operator to understand how both the team and the enemy could use it to their advantage. The ability to use maps in this way was an untaught, and underreported, indispensable skill. Number 4. Meticulous attention to detail. Special operators are known for running operations by the seat of their pants. However, much of what they had to do was annoying and repetitive. Team members had to know what equipment each other team member was carrying, and where it was located. Every team had standard procedures that each man knew. Unfortunately, without constant inspections things tend to move around, magazines don't get reloaded, canteens are half empty, and rations are eaten. 
the more elite the unit the greater the probability that the little things are taken for granted. It is often expressed as, I trust my men. SOG operators trusted their men, but that never kept them from the tedious task of inspecting and re-inspecting. Paying attention to detail, saved lives. Number 3. Maintaining stealth and concealment. By necessity enemy base camps, truck parks, and storage facilities were located in low areas, with high overhead jungle cover, and access to water. In order to avoid detection, SOG team insertions were generally made high and dry, a few kilometers away. Still the odds were great that they were compromised. The enemy would see or hear the helicopters and know that a team was on the ground. The North Vietnamese routinely conducted area security patrols. These efforts would be immediately stepped up. The SOG team would literally have to disappear. This not only meant that they would have to be expertly camouflaged and totally silent, but they had to move slowly and methodically through the densest parts of the mountain jungle, obscuring their tracks and sleeping in places where most people wouldn't walk. Progress was painfully slow. With steep slopes and dense jungle, it could take a full day to cover the distance of a half kilometer on a map. Movement to the target, carrying heavy loads of ammunition and supplies, through thick mountain jungle was extremely grinding and boring. If a couple of days passed without any signs of the enemy, it was difficult to maintain this discipline. Changing the route to a less dense area of the jungle would begin to look like an attractive option. It would be easier and speed their journey, even at the risk of greater exposure. However, there were no shortcuts to survival in SOG. Failure to maintain strict stealth and concealment would eventually end in disaster. Number 2. High levels of initiative and intelligence. By the time enough information on the NVA's counter-recon measures had been accumulated, and SOG's in-country training school opened, most of SOG's missions had already been completed. Before that, their ground operators received no mission-specific training. They had been taught the basic skills, and received advice from more experienced operators, but their knowledge base was woefully inadequate. With a schedule of one or two missions per month, and the extremely high casualty rate, nothing a SOG team did, ever became routine. Their mission preparation was often based on little more than speculation a situation that is considered totally unacceptable in today's modern special operations. Most military combat training, attempts to create automatic responses to situations, because there is no time for thinking. To survive a SOG operator had to have a mind that never stopped working no matter what the circumstances. He constantly faced new situations, and had to make decisions with incomplete information. Survival demanded an extremely high level of initiative and intelligence. It has been said that if a SOG operator was about to be burnt at the stake, he would be judging wind speed to determine whether he was about to burn to death or die by smoke inhalation. Before we get to number one, I encourage you to read my book, Dawson's War. Rather than just a recounting of various missions, Dawson's War puts you on the ground with five men from SOG, including two you saw in this video, for the 12 months of my first tour. Through Dawson's War, you will get a very clear sense of what it was like to serve in SOG, and you will definitely enjoy being in the company of these men. It has over 400 five-star ratings. Pick up a copy at Amazon. All right. The number one skill to stay alive in SOG. Determining when to call for an emergency extraction. A SOG team leader had the absolute authority to terminate a mission, at any time, for any reason, without question. This was considered SOG's most sacred pact between ground operators and their commanders. Once an emergency was declared, operations was duty-bound to send all available assets to extract the team as quickly as possible. The scope of SOG operations became solely controlled by the men on the ground. It is often assumed that when soldiers are allowed to determine the length of a battle, they would shirk their duty. However, history teaches us that when elite troops are employed, the exact opposite is true. Julius Caesar tells us that when the centuria were given their head, they would drive the battle further than their commanders dared. Military greats from Khan to Napoleon, have warned that this allowed commanders to avoid responsibility for unnecessary losses. SOG proved no exception. Unbridled, SOG operators relentlessly attempted to complete their missions. Often to their detriment. After the Battle of Hamburger Hill, President Nixon ordered the end of all American offensive ground operations. But SOG continued to fight like it was 1966. Every year the North Vietnamese added to their defenses in Laos, and targets became more and more dangerous to complete. By 1970 North Vietnamese anti-aircraft, restricted the use of helicopter insertions in large portions of Laos. So at a time when most military commanders knew the war was winding down, 
and their only goal was to bring their troops home alive, Sog began experimenting with extremely risky high-altitude low-opening parachute jumps, to penetrate the enemy jungle sanctuaries. Most Sog operators understood the enemy situation on the ground, and realized when things were going sideways, but they kept trying to find workarounds, sometimes until they ran out of workarounds. The ability of a SOG operator to know when a mission was impossible, and the willingness to declare an emergency extraction, was, by far, the number one skill it took to stay alive in SOG. On more than one occasion, SOG was given an overly ambitious mission, and we paid quite a price. I think you'll find this video interesting.